Okay, it's time to look at chi-squared independence testing. In fact, what I'm going to show you is going to be useful for both chi-squared independence testing, chi-squared goodness of fit testing, and t-tests. It's a bit complicated seeming at first, and so this video here, I'm just going to be giving you an introduction to all the terms we're going to use. I'm actually not going to show you how to solve anything yet. All the next videos after this one are going to be about that, okay? So just so you know, we're going to be talking about you know, an introduction for how we work with hypothesis testing. Now, I'm not doing a section at the end about like why should you care, because this is stuff that everyone seems to care about. If you do any kind of work where you want to look at statistics of your data, so let's say you're in biology or something like that, and you want to look at the efficacy of a drug, this is the kind of testing you're going to do, one of these ones. Um, if you want to look at, I don't know, how well some new product works, you want to say, oh, is it significantly better? When we use the word significant, we're going to define what we mean by that. We have these things called significance levels. So we've got a mathematical test to tell us a few different things. One is if two different things are independent of each other or not, which is where I'm going with this one. We're going to do another one for goodness of fit. It's going to tell us um, if something follows the distribution it's supposed to. Or this one right here for testing uh, the averages. So we're going to test if uh, these two things right here, if the averages of two different samples are the same or not. Or if one is bigger than the other or one is smaller than the other. We can actually determine that. How significantly bigger they are or less than or whatever. So. The idea behind this is we're going to determine this chi-squared independence test. We're going to use it to tell if one variable is independent of another variable. So in other words, we're going to say, is A independent of B? Now, we don't know what A or B are going to be. That could be anything. That could be anything depending on the situation. So we're going to find out essentially if there's a big difference between you know expected frequencies and observed frequencies. So let me show you that. By the way, this is a reference from an old movie called The Office. Uh, it was hilarious. Um, all right, so let's look at measurement and observed frequencies. It helps to use an example, so let's put something into a table. So I found some data, this is really interesting. You know, some people say, oh, people who smoke are really dumb, or are they really smart, or you know, whatever. So I was like, hey, I actually managed to find some data on intelligence levels. So this is low, average, high, or very high. They were taking an IQ test. Keep in mind, that may be flawed, but there you go. That was their study. And smoking, they said either non-smokers, medium smokers, or heavy smokers. For some reason, they didn't have any sort of light smokers. I'm not sure what happened with that. But uh, there we go. Keep in mind, a lot could be said about how you gather this data. So your sampling techniques are going to be really important here. But let's just say you're working with this data here. Notice very well, one thing very important with chi-squared independence testing. We have categories. Do you notice there's a category called low, average, high, very high. Another category called non, medium, and heavy. And what we're counting in here are just the frequencies. These numbers are here inside are just frequencies. We're just counting, you know, how many people satisfy this. So we're not saying like, how tall are you? Do you notice that? Like, how tall are you doesn't really kind of work here. Otherwise, if you're doing like, how tall are you? That could be something like, you know, on the x axis. And you could say like, I don't know, shoe size, for example, could be on the y. That would be better suited to doing a linear regression. This is not what this is. Here we have to categorize. You could say short and tall. Okay, fine. Maybe you take the average, you know, the mean of all your uh, tallness, you know, all the mean of all your data, and maybe anybody below the mean is called short, anybody above the mean is called tall. Fine. That's a way to categorize. But you notice the key thing here is chi-squared independence testing is all about categories. You have to split things into categories. And how you define those and how you explain those is really important. Especially, hint, hint, if you do an internal assessment, hint, hint, on this. This is really, really important. So let's just say we got this data right here. The idea would be to try to determine, hey, is intelligence and smoking, are they independent or not? Because you could say if they're independent, that means, well, it doesn't matter. Your intelligence and smoking aren't related in some way. Uh, or you can find out if they're not. Now, keep in mind, we don't say they're dependent. All we can state is independent or not independent. It's weird that we have this distinction, but it's important. So pro tip, um, the IB has said that you're going to have a maximum of four rows or four columns. So this is something that you might see on an exam, something like that. All right. So uh, we're going to have something called an expected frequency table. Do you see here we've got all the frequencies that are observed. Maybe I should label this. I'll label this right here the observed frequencies. Observed frequencies. 
Maybe that'll be important here. Okay, so this right here, this whole thing right here is the observed frequencies table. Well, we have to do something. Remember I said uh, right here, we're going to be trying to look at if there's a difference between expected frequencies and observed frequencies. So this is what we actually see. Maybe we poll these people depending on how we've sampled the data. Now we have to figure out what are the expected frequencies. So I'm going to show you how we can gather this because keep in mind, our goal is going to be to have this one right here. This is going to be the expected I'm just going to skip ahead here. It's going to be expected frequencies. Here are two tables we would ideally be looking at. Okay, So this would be our expected frequencies table. That would be this one. So do you see we'd be comparing two different tables? The observed frequencies table and the expected frequencies table. That's what we would do. So what I'm going to show you now is you don't actually need this for your exam. This is really important. Okay, So on your actual exam, they've said you're not going to be asked to do this. This, this next calculation right here, I'm going to show you right here. You won't need to do this for your actual exam because your calculator will do this for you. In your calculator, you'll just put in this info and your calculator will tell you this answer here. But I want to show you how to do it by hand real quick, like just to show you how you can do this because for your internal assessment, this is a really good idea if you do it on stats. So what we do is to find out what's needed, we do a row total times a column total divided by a table total. This is going to be the key thing here we're going to do. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to put that over here because we're going to need that over here. This is the idea behind it is we would take this and do it over here. Let me show you what I mean by this. Okay, so this is going to be the important thing. I'm just going to show you this right here. This is going to be how we're going to determine all this. Well, first we need to know all the sums. So what I would do here, I would start by saying, all right, well, give me the sums. I need the sums. In other words, I need to count up all these totals here. I need these totals here. I need to figure out, you know, what's the total? Actually, let me go like this. Like this. I haven't done it very nicely, but you'll see what I'm going to do in a second here. And All right, so what I'm going to need to do is figure out what are all the totals. So as I add up this plus this plus this plus this equals this. So you can easily use your calculator for that, right? So you can just say, all right, well, give me the sums of these values. So I want to... Uh, Oh, my calculator is too big. I can't see the data here. So I want to do uh, 279 plus 386 plus 96 plus 2. Do you get the idea what I'm doing here? So I go, all right, that is, so what answer was that? 763. Do you see what I've done here? 763. Keep in mind, similarly, I'm going to do the same thing. So 387, 313. So I would do the same thing along there. Along this right here, I would also do it. So I would add up all those values. I get 502, 734. I'm just trying to save time so you don't watch me on the calculator, but I promise this should work. All these ones should add up to 218 and 9. Okay, so 218 and 9. Well, then we need to know the total sum of the sums. So to see what I would do here, I would just use my calculator to add up those numbers. So 7, I'll make it a little bit bigger so I can see what I'm doing here. 763 plus 387 plus 313. Do you see I'm adding up this right here? I'm adding to get that value. Do you see I get 1463? 1463. Now let's add up to the left uh, on the left side and make sure that that works. This is your sort of check sum as we call it in programming is that you want to make sure that these numbers right here all add up to the same thing because this should be the total number of people who were polled. 1463. So did you notice, and this is the total of the totals kind of thing? So this is what I've done. This is kind of boring, isn't it? But if you need to do this for your IA, this would be important to do this by hand. You can easily do this in Excel. You can say this, you know, this equals all these added together. Or you can use Google Sheets or whatever you like to use. But this is the idea behind it is we're going to use this idea here to figure them out. Watch. What I'm going to do now to figure out what should be here, let's just uh, guess maybe this one right here. For any given value, what you do is you multiply the row total. This is a row. This right here is a column. I think of columns because they stand up. Like, you know, if you go to Athens, for example, there's the Colosseum. See, it's got lots of columns. I've actually been there. It's beautiful. There we go. Something. I don't know. Is it called the Parthenon? No, I can't remember. No, this actually, I think it's called the Parthenon, not the Colosseum. Parthenon has a bunch of columns. This is the one in Greece. Uh, Colosseum is in Rome. Um, 
Listen, here's in Athens, right? It's on top of a hill. It's beautiful. Anyway, so if we go and try to figure out what will this value right here be, how will I figure this out? I use this idea. The row total. Well, what row am I in? Let's take a look. I'm in this row. Do you notice? And I'm in this column in order to get this value. Does that make any sense? I've got like this row and this column. So I'm going to take my row total, which is 763. I'm going to multiply that by the column total, which is 734. Oops, it's supposed to be a 4. And then I would divide that by the total of the table, so 1, 4, 6, 3. And just to show you, hopefully this works. Please work. Um, so I'll do that. So I'll do 763 times, I'm just showing you one calculation, okay? But hopefully you'll get the idea. Then I divide that by uh, 1463, and I get, whoops, what's this approximately equal to? Oh no. I wanted this approximately. There we go. 382.8. What did I say it is? 382.8. Do you notice that's how I get that number? And just in case you want to see how to do it, maybe I'll do a different one. Maybe I'll do this one right here just to show you. So this number right here. Well, they'll be in this row and this column. Do you see that? Like this is sort of where its coordinates are. That's where it sits. So I would do 313. Do you notice this is this total times this total, which is 218. But I would still divide it by 1463. And this number then will give me 57.7 and so on. You basically do this all the way along until you get these numbers. This is your expected frequencies table. So if you need to do this by hand, there you go. That's how you would do it by hand. Now, keep in mind, um, your expected frequencies should be greater than 5. In other words, all your numbers in here better be greater than 5. Whoops, this one isn't. Because if it's not, um, and they've told us at least on exams, what will happen is uh, they'll give you those greater than 5. Because it turns out, for your IA especially, this is important, if you have values where it's less than 5, there's a lot of arguments as to whether or not you should do this, but I think it's a good idea for your IA. You should look up what's called Yates Continuity Correction. You basically take your chi-squared value and you subtract 5, I think, from the top value. I'll show you. Uh, at least I'll show you the chi-squared thing. But keep in mind, do you have to know how to do this for your exams? No. On your exams, all you have to be able to do is see this table, shove that into your calculator. All right, that's a lot of explanation for nothing, right? Uh, now we've got this thing called a chi-squared statistics. And again, this is one more thing that's not needed for your exam, but useful for your IA is we have an equation for this. Keep in mind, your calculator will do this, okay? So your calculator will tell you this. This will be the key here, what we're going to do. So we do have an equation for chi-squared. You do not necessarily need it, but it goes like this. So the chi-squared statistic is going to be the sum of, let's see now, it's going to be the, um, is it expected or observed? Which one comes first? I just got to look it up. There we go. So it's uh, observed minus expected squared, all that over uh, Fe. So this is the equation we're going to be using. Now this, like I said, is not needed for your, uh, not needed for exams. Okay, so not needed on the exam. Now why am I showing you this then? Because your IA a lot of students choose to do their IAs and stats. That's why it's a good idea. And keep in mind what these different values are. This is going to be observed frequency. It's going to be FO, F for frequency. So it's like frequency observed. This is frequency expected. So what you could do, you could do this on Excel, couldn't you? Like to keep in mind in Excel or you know Google Sheets or whatever it is you like to use. You could just sit there and make yourself a table, couldn't you? You could have a table of all your different uh, expected frequencies. Just put those down as a big list. Just like tick, 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 tick. How about your observed frequencies? You just put them down as a list. Keep in mind, I know they were in a matrix like this, but you can just go like first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth. Just do them in that order or something like that. That'll be fine. So imagine you put those in. You put them all. You get them all. Well, then what you have to do is do, uh, maybe you do FO minus FE. You do a column that's just that. Wouldn't that be easy to say this, this equals just this minus this, and you get all your values here. All right, then what do you do? Well, you do that squared. So FO minus FE squared. You do that. So you just take this answer. This equals this squared. You have that list of numbers. Well, then you say, all right, this one is FO minus FE squared. In other words, take this answer and just divide it by FE. So you notice what you would do here? You would say, this equals this divided by this. You get your list. And when you're done, can't you just ask your calculator for the sum? Uh, not your calculator, sorry. Uh, but you can just do the sum, can't you? So you can say this equals the sum of all these. So you can say, hey, add up all these. 
So this plus this plus this plus this plus this plus this, and that is your answer for chi squared. So you could do this kind of by hand, as it were. Now your calculator will do this for you. So your chi squared statistic, the whole point of doing this, I know I haven't shown you all the details, I'm just trying to set you up for success here. This number chi squared is going to tell you something. We're going to use it to make decisions as to if things are independent or not or whatever. So this, this is going to be the key if you want to do it by hand. Now let's go back to what you really need for your exam. So now we are for what you need for your exams here. Um, we have something called a null hypothesis, and that's going to be written like this. It's going to be H for hypothesis and 0 for null. However, this one right here, we can have what's called an alternate hypothesis. It's like there's a different idea. It's called H1. Okay, so we're going to define it like this. We're going to say H0, whatever you're looking at, your first thing, and whatever else you're looking at, you're going to say my null hypothesis H0 is that blah and blah are independent. This is the key to doing this. And, and what we're going to do is mathematically show if is this statement correct or is it not correct. And this whole branch of what we're doing is called hypothesis testing. And all three of chi-squared independence testing, chi-squared goodness of fit testing, and t-tests use this idea. We're going to make a statement, and then we're going to mathematically say, do we keep it or do we reject it? So sometimes it helps to think of the alternate hypothesis. In chi-squared independence testing, it's not so important, but trust me, for um, especially what is it for t-test, this is really important, your alternate one. But here you could say, well, I guess your alternate one could be this and this are not independent. See, this is like the other thing. This is the more important one for now, though. So what you're going to do, you're going to do this test, you're going to do this chi-squared business. It's going to tell you some numbers, and you're going to then use those numbers to determine is this correct or is it not? That's going to be sort of the idea here. So, uh, by the way, whoops, I should have put H0, shouldn't I? H0. So this is going to be the idea here. We're going to do the chi-squared test, and we're going to figure out if we should reject H0 or not. There's going to be some different criteria we're going to use. So finally now, I'm just going to go through a bunch of quick definitions, because we're going to, uh, in the next video after this, I'm going to show you how to put it all together. You're going to see then it's going to be much easier once we know about these terms. So what do we need? We need something called a critical value. You'll be given these, but keep in mind if you needed to look them up, you could. They have to do with the significance level. Usually there's a table like those on the top, and usually this is called the degrees of freedom. Usually they like one, two, three, four. Maybe significance level will be like 10%, 5%. 1%, and there'll be a bunch of data values here. So they could actually, if you're doing your IA, you should look this up. Um, but on a test, they're going to give you these. So check, you're going to have those. Do you see that? So critical value, no prob, you're going to get that. Significance level. This is going to be, um, the IB has said you're going to only be needing these three different cases. So you'll be given this. It'll either be 10% significance level, 5%, or 1%. What does this mean? Well, it basically tells us how accurate do we want to be, or how what is yeah what is the minimum acceptable probability that they're independent. Basically, this means it's kind of dodgy. At 10% means ah, it's pretty easy to pass it. At 5% means oh, you're a lot more stringent on this. And at 1% means oh, that means you're confident within 1% that this is correct. So just see, it's easier to pass a test here. It's harder here. It's even harder here. Obviously, the best test, I guess, you want it to within the lowest. So. What do you use for significance levels? Well, if you want it to within 10%, then you make your significance level 0.1, because that's what 10% is. 10 over 100 is 0.1. If you want 5%, use 0.05. That's 5 over 100. If you want 1%, then use 0.01. .01. These are going to be the main things that you should sort of consider when you do these. Now again, this won't make that much sense right now. I'm just introducing a bunch of terms, but it's going to, I think, once I show you how to put it all together. It's a hard one to put together because there's so many terms to introduce. I just figured I'll give you all the terms, then we'll put them together. We'll tie it together. We're almost done. We've got something called degrees of freedom. Technically, it's when you fix a value in a table and how the others can vary. You don't need to do, know too, too much about it, except it really helps to know. This is for, this is for, uh, for chi-squared independence testing. This is it testing, then we do this right here. This is the important one here. So we've got this equation right here. Your thing called a degrees of freedom is going to be r minus 1 times c minus 1. And what's r? That's your number of rows. c is a number of columns. Columns. 
So if you have like, a, well, in our example over here, how many rows did I have? I had uh, one, two, I had three rows, four columns. So in the case of that one, let's see here now. Three rows, four columns, let's see. So three rows, four columns, let's see what that would give me. Well, I would say degrees of freedom would be, let's see, it would be 3 minus 1 times 4 minus 1. What does that give me? This is 2 times 3, so that gives me 6. So my degrees of freedom, for example, would be 6. That would be my example here. Okay, so if I added that one. Uh, pro tip, on exams at least, they've said that the degrees of freedom will always be greater than 1. All right, fine. Last definitions. We got something called a p value. That's the value of p. It's something, it's actually the probability of getting your result by chance. We're going to be finding this on your calculator. So we're going to see, like, uh, I don't know, maybe if like p is uh, 0 0.0238, for example. This could be an example of that. We're going to be looking at what we do with all these things. Okay, so in another video, the next video, I'm going to show you how to put all this together and do this. It turns out we're going to be comparing chi-squared and p and significance and critical values. Some of them were given. So we're going to be given um, critical values and significance levels, and we're going to be finding p and chi-squared, and we're going to see what to do with them.